Yeah. <laughs> we're going to close the door. Good. We're live, everybody. Except it says this video is private, so I'm not sure if it's going to work. Let's see. Um, I've pressed the live button. Oh, and it is working. It says this video is private, so I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Oops, I just want to, now we get this feedback thing. OK, great. I think it's working. Sorry, we had a few technical problems there right at the start, but we seem to have got everything um, working again. And welcome back to the new Friends of Tracking, the, um, the live version. It was a shame to miss it last week. It was actually a national holiday in Sweden. So um, we didn't get it going, but um, we're back this week. And we've got two very exciting guests here who both have an academic background, but started, or um, Jan has started working for Sci Sports and uh, started up a company, and Lotta is also working for them. And um, what we're going to do today is we're going to let them talk and tell us a little bit about how you value actions using event data. What's really cool is these guys are going to actually start up, um, start doing, taking over the lessons now. I was just saying that I'm I just finished my last expected goals video and I'm getting a little bit tired, <laughs> to be honest. So um, it's really be fun for them, for, for me, for them to take over there. going to do actually five, five videos, I think. They promised me that. You filmed, they filmed one of them um, over the next few weeks. Uh, but what I'm actually going to do is actually, without any further ado, it's Lotta, you're going to uh, share your screen. Yep. And I'm going to go over to Lotta and allow her to take control and present her um, presentation. Do you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, thanks. Um, well, uh, uh, as David already said, we will uh, uh, share some tutorials uh, and they will be focused on value and actions in football. And uh, well, we, we will answer the question how to discover the new Frankie de Jong using data. And well, a quick introduction about, uh, about Jan and me. Uh, we both work at SciSports. Um, I'm their lead, lead, data science, lead data scientist at SciSports and uh, Jan is our chief product, and, okay, thanks. Uh, chief and product and technology officer. Um, and at Sci Sports, we uh, well we help uh, football clubs to scout new players for their team. So that's also where what we'll be focusing on uh, in this uh, this presentation. And well, as you can imagine, scouts uh, like these uh, are, are faced with a multitude of questions. So when they're like uh, watching a game or they're watching uh, videos from home, they always want to know uh, certain things from these players. So for example, what is the player's current and potential ability? Like, is he got good enough for my team or for my club? Uh, what is his expect expected transfer fee? So are we able to, to buy this player? What is his playing style? So would he fit uh, my team's playing style? And also like how valuable is he with his actions? So how valuable is he to, the, uh, to his team? Well, and as you can imagine, it's like it will be impossible for, for a single scout uh, to manually answer these questions for all professional football players around the world. There's more than 100,000 professional, same professional football players around the world. And as we're focused on scouting, we, we well, we want to uh, see all these players and want to answer these questions for these players. And that's where data can help. So it can help the scouts to, to bring down this big pool of players to like a short, a short list of a few players. And then the scouts can uh, can see these players uh, in, in real life because live scouting will always, I think, uh, be a part of the, of the scouting process. Uh, but this will help the player, the scouts to focus on the right players to scout. So outline of this presentation, uh, we will first explain why we would go beyond traditional statistics to assess football players. Uh, then, we can, then how we can assess these performances of players. Then we will talk about the framework, the VAPE framework that, uh, uh, that, we, uh, uh, that we created and wrote a paper about. And then we will explain what we will learn you in the tutorials and what you can learn in, the, in those. To start with the first question, so why would we go beyond traditional statistics? So to go back to these, uh, these questions that the scouts uh, might have, in this presentation, we will focus on the one on the uh, right bottom. So how valuable are the player's actions? So what's actually the impact of this player on his team? 
And therefore, um, well, people started to, to value actions. It is actually started with, with shots. And well, David already uh, put out some, uh, some tutorials on expected goals. So I won't go into detail uh, uh, what they do, but actually what, what expected goals models do is they uh, assign a value to every shot that happens uh, on the pitch. And it's, well, it quantifies the quality of the goal scoring opportunity. So if we look at this example, it's the, the great goal by uh, Robin van Persie against uh, Spain in the World Cup. Um, and this was actually like a, a low scoring, a goal scoring opportunity as uh, well, an expected goals model would account for the, the fact that he has to uh, uh, do the shot with his head and not with his foot. Um, and that's, uh, well, that's actually how, how people started to, to value actions. However, uh, fewer than 1% of the on, on, on the goal actions in football matches are actually shots. So here's an example of uh, a, a match between uh, City and, uh, and Wolfram Wonders. And well, these are all the shots in this match. And as you can see, there's a lot of other on the ball actions that also are in this match. Um, and well, if you only look at expected goals, you can only tell something about uh, well, the colored dots. And actually, you want to tell something about all the dots in here. And that's why, uh, well, we need to go to look beyond uh, shots. And if you then, for example, look at passes, um, people started to look at traditional statistics. So uh, passing accuracy is a very common uh, statistic where, where uh, people look at. Um, and it tells you something about the, the qualities of a player. However, if you look at this um, this list of the top, this is the top five uh, players with the highest passing accuracy in the previous uh, uh, Premier League season, you see that this, this is mostly, uh, these are mostly uh, defenders. And uh, Kevin De Bruyne, who is known for his uh, excellent passing, is uh, well way beyond in terms of passing accuracy. And while well, the main reason behind, behind this is that uh, well, defenders, central defenders, centre backs, they can pass to each other, and this will always be seen as a positive, uh, as a good pass, um, like a pass that's successful. However, it doesn't really add value to the game, and that's actually what we want to measure. And another example uh, of a traditional statistic is the number of assists. And I have two videos to show you why this is also not uh, perfect. So the first video, uh, a number of assists, for example. Um, and if we then look at this example by uh, Busquets passing the ball to Messi, he receives the ball, dribbles, and scores. So what the issue here is, is that the first pass, that was like, well, pretty good pass by Fabregas to Hazard, giving him a good opportunity, is not an assist or not a key pass. Uh, so a key pass is a pass that leads to a shot, on, to a shot. Um, on the other hand, the ball by Busquets, which was a well, pretty easy pass to give, um, is an assist. And that is mainly because of the qualities of Messi and not really because of the pass itself. So um, that's why um, there, there should be other ways to assess these performances of football players, so to value their actions. And that is why uh, people started proposing uh, frameworks. And as far as we know, uh, Sarah Witt was the first one to propose such a framework in 2011. So she gave a presentation where she uh, uh, proposed this framework to value each player action. And uh, well, since then, several other action value frameworks have, uh, have appeared. So, uh, so our own the paper that uh, Jan and I wrote together with Tom de Kroos and Jesse Davis from the K Leuven, the Action Speaks Louder Than Goals paper. Um, it's what the, uh, it's a, a, a paper that explains the uh, an action value framework, as well as the expected threat by Kang Hun Singh. Uh, where he wrote a blog post about. Uh, then we have the uh, deep learning expected possession value framework from uh, Javier Fernandez, Luc Bourne, and Ben Zervon that uses tracking data to uh, value actions. And as well as uh, the blog post by uh, Statsbomb, by Opta Pro, and recently, just this week, a few days ago, uh, American Stock Analysis also has a, had a, a blog post on the, that's, that introduced uh, an action value framework. And all these frameworks, they have like uh, well similarities and also different in some aspects. So some of the some of them um, are handicapped, some of them are data driven. Some focus only on offensive contribution, others on both offensive and defensive contribution. And some uh, focus more on the pitch location, and others have like more expressive game states. And there's also some that are uh, using event data, and others are using tracking data. And it's also a really nice paper by uh, Michael van Roy, Peter Robrechts, Tom de Kroos, and Jesse Davis on, uh, that compares the expected threat from uh, Kamen Singh to our uh, VAPE framework. And in this presentation, we will focus on the, on the VAPE framework that has those, uh, uh, those traits. 
So what does the VAPE framework have to offer? Well, we first discuss what kind of data we use. I already mentioned the, the event data and the tracking data. So how are we see it is like, well, broadly three uh, different flavors of, of, of uh, data in football. So you have the matchy data, that's really uh, general data that describes uh, well, the lineups, substitutions, the score in a match, uh, the cards, um, and sometimes a bit more. And then we have the ball event data that describes every action of uh, every event that happens on the, on the pitch. So every on the ball action. And the tracking data uh, is the most detailed. So it has like all the player uh, positions for during a complete game and also the ball. However, um, availability decreases as granularity increases. So uh, while tracking data is um, well most detailed, it's not uh, highly, uh, well, it's limited available uh, like in lower leagues. So as we're looking for the new Frankie de Jong, we don't only want to look in uh, the high, uh, high level leagues, but we also want to look uh, a bit lower than that. And that's why uh, event data is very useful in the recruiting process. So it, because it's, it's widely available for hundreds of competitions, it gets um, more and more uh, information over the years. Uh, event data has changed and captures more and more information. And it's also easier to process and to analyze uh, than player tracking data. That's actually the reason why Vape uses the event data to try the actions. And in this uh, slide, you see an example of, uh, of event data, so the sequence uh, and event data. This is the, uh, the goal by uh, De Bruyne in the, in the World Cup against uh, Brazil. Um, and you see that it's, well, it annotates the location um, of actions, the type of actions. So was it a shot, a pass, a clearance? Uh, as well as uh, the time the time in the match and also some other uh, information that you get um, in the data. So the, the, there are different providers, but they all have well, similarities and also differences, of course. So how do we then uh, value uh, the action by Busquets to, to Messi? So the pass that we show in, in the video, if you want to, um, to value this, this, uh, this action using our faith framework, we look at the pre-action game state and the post-action game state. So the pre-action game state is the game state in which uh, Busquets has the ball and he wants to pass to, to Messi. And the post-action game state is when Messi has received the ball. What we don't actually want to do is we want to measure the difference between those two game states. And therefore, we want to know for each of those game states, um, we want to know how likely it is that uh, the team in possession will score a goal from this game state in the near future. And also how likely it is that they will concede a goal from this game state. So, well, as you can imagine, maybe in this example, the likeness of conceding a goal might be low, but we also want to uh, value uh, clearances, for example. And clearances mainly have the goal of, uh, well, decreasing the chance of conceding a goal and not really of increasing your own chance of scoring. So if you continue with this example, um, well, we use uh, machine learning techniques to, to uh, determine the likeness of scoring a goal in this game state. And what we actually do uh, high level is uh, we look for similar game, set, game states that we've seen in the past. Um, so we can look back um, to historical matches that the computer already has seen uh, of event data. And then it can look for different, uh, for similar game states um, that has seen in the past. And it can uh, count how many of those similar game states led to a goal in the near future. So if you look at this example, for example, we find 100 similar game states, then and, and in this example, three out of them uh, lead to a goal. Then this, this game state value of Busquets possessing the ball in this position is 0 0.03. In the tutorials, we will explain a bit more how you can uh, find these examples and how you can uh, represent the game states. As well, we do this, the same for the conceding a goal. So uh, how likely is it to concede a goal from this game state? And this example it might be 0 0.02. And if we then have the, the, the values for both of those game states, so the likeness to score a goal and the likeness to concede a goal, for example, this, these are random numbers, for example, 0 0.03, 0 0.02 for, uh, for Busquets, and the other values for Messi having the ball there, then we can measure the, the increase in uh, the likeness of scoring a goal. That's 0 0.02. And the, you can also measure the uh, decrease in conceding a goal, so the likeness of conceding a goal. And that's actually what, what we want to uh, value this player for, for Busquets. So what he did, he increased the chance of scoring a goal with 0 0.02, and we dec he decreased the chance of conceding a goal with 0 0.01. Then his uh, vape value will be 0 0.03, so the sum of those two values. So if we go back to the example, uh, the two examples that I showed in the beginning, 
uh, the long ball from Fabregas and the, uh, the sideward pass from, uh, from Busquets to Messi, then we can see that uh, the vape ratings, they do account for the context. Uh, so they, um, uh, they value the ball by Busquets uh, seven times, uh, the ball by Fabregas seven times higher than the one by, uh, by Busquets. And in that way, we can see that it, it does account for, for the difference of the, between those two passes. But yeah, uh, well, if we have this value for every action, then, then what can, how can we use this to, to scout new players? Well, what we can do is we can look at the total impact that a player has uh, during a, a game. So if we, uh, this table shows the, the top 10 players um, who played at least 900 minutes in the current uh, Premier League season. So we just uh, updated this last, last week. So it's the most recent numbers. And, uh, <clears throat> and the VAPE. Per 90 means actually or the sum of all the, the, the action ratings that we have. So for every pass, every dribble, every clearance, we have a rating. We sum them all up and then we normalize per minutes played because not every player played enough the, the same number of minutes. So that's why we need to normalize for that. And then you can see well that uh, these uh, well pretty well known players end up in the top. But it's interesting. I think you might all know these players. Uh, but as we're looking as we're scouting and we want to find the new uh, the new Frankie Dion. We might not really want to find uh, the players, the best players in the Premier League, but we want to look into uh, some lower league. So uh, uh, I look back into time. Uh, so this is a, a screenshot of our, um, our side sports platform where we have like the fake ratings uh, uh, implemented. Um, this is in 2016, 2017 in the uh, second uh, uh, division of the Netherlands. So the eerste divisie it's called, the second level. And we see that uh, uh, Frankie de Jong was the back then, so for three, four years ago, uh, already the, the best player in this uh, in this league. Um, so the more to the right, the higher vape uh, rating you have, uh, the more to the left, the lower vape rating. And uh, well, we all know Frankie de Jong right now, I guess. Uh, but I looked into the platform to find uh, uh, the new, uh, well, I wouldn't call him the new Frankie de Jong, but the new uh, Dutch uh, hidden gem. So it's called Jan Paul van Hecke, very Dutch name, uh, from Nagoya Dai, the cent center back. And we see that he's like uh, really uh, well, really valuable with his uh, his passes and uh, uh, and, and well, actually always actions uh, on the ball. Um, and he's just 20 years old, uh, so uh, he might be a very interesting player uh, for the future for the Dutch uh, Dutch national team. Um, well, interesting that we can find uh, those players, but there's many other things that you can do with action ratings. So it's not only for scouting, but can also be used for other stuff. So this first question well, is, is scouting. So maybe you're, uh, you're a scout and you're flying, um, a scout is flying to, uh, to Scandinavia to, to, to find some players. And it might be interesting to find uh, well, the young players in this region that uh, are interesting to, to look into. Um, but also for opponent uh, uh, analysis, it might be very interesting to know the, the weaknesses of your opponent uh, as well as the strengths of your opponent. Um, and it's also interesting to to look at different slices of uh, of action uh, of the actions. So if you know uh, all action ratings, you can also see like okay, how does this player perform in important matches, and how does he play he perform in like well less important matches? Is there a difference, or in the last minutes of the match, or like when the weather is really bad? Right? Maybe it's like a South American player who doesn't really play well when it's snowing. Um, as well as uh, different tactical systems, but you can think of many other uh, slices, but might be very interesting to look into. So, um, well, to conclude on the, the vape ratings, uh, this is the paper that uh, uh, that we wrote about this, and there's a very inter very cool tool that uh, Peter Robrechts made from the Leuven. Um, that I would advise you to check it out. You can uh, you can play around with uh, with the vape ratings. So you have like a, you see like an action, and you can just drag around uh, the actions and see what happens with the ratings to get more more insights in what uh, what's happening. So what will you learn in the tutorials that Jan and I will uh, put online? Um, well, we will share uh, well five tutorials. So one tutorial what, which will go a bit deeper into the uh, the, the uh, theory about, uh, behind this uh, this model. And then these four tutorials will be like really uh, looking into the code and really uh, get to work yourself. So the first one will be um, the complete pipeline. So what we always do uh, is that we when you start a new project, you first want to have like end to end pipeline. So get it to work from raw event data up until the results. Um, and we will use uh, Rice, uh raw event data for this uh, for these tutorials. Um, 
And then in the other three tutorials, we will uh, each of them will dig a bit deeper into one of the steps of the process. So uh, feature representation, that's more about how you can describe the game states so uh, and actions. So um, how can you describe what kind of game state you are in? Um, then you can use these, these features to train your machine learning model. So in, in the, uh, the third tutorial, we will dig a bit deep, deeper into that. And then the fourth one, we will discuss how you can like evaluate the results, validate your results, and also how you can improve uh, your models. And on this GitHub repository in the bottom, uh, well, the code will be available there soon. It's not, currently there's no, nothing there yet, but uh, it will be soon. And then, um, well, some uh, a long list of uh, papers and blog posts that I would uh, advise you to, uh, to look into. So there's a lot of, what I already mentioned, a lot of people that uh, put their action uh, value frameworks out there. So this is the list of, uh, of blog posts and papers that, uh, that talk about these frameworks. And that's, uh, that's actually everything uh, I want to share. So uh, well, when we're sharing the, the videos, uh, everyone is welcome to, uh, to uh, ask questions to us, to Jan or me, through Twitter or through, uh, through email. So uh, that's it. That's fantastic. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Lotta. Um, what, what I'm going to do is, can I put you on the- so Stop sharing this? Yeah, stop sharing the video and yeah. um, we'll put you um, wait a minute, I want speaker view. There we go. So um, we'll, we'll put the speaker view on. Um, I'll start. So I, th I think I'll, I'll structure it as, as follows so we get some sort of organization in the questions because I think there's lots to discussion that we'd like to do. So what we'll do is maybe we can go through um, each of us and ask you each one question. And then when we feel that we've, um, and that will be a question, not a long uh, discussion <laughs> about something else that, uh, that you've done. <laughs> um, and then after that, we could each talk a little bit about how we've used this type of methods in our own work. Because I know that all of us have at some point used this, these types of methods, and we can talk a little bit about the limitations. But I think now I've said that we're going to ask a question, I, I think I, um, I have to. I have to have the the same question. I'd just like to know. So you, there's a lot of strengths to what you do. Could you tell me what are the limitations in uh, in the approach that you have? And the, these questions, of course, both to Jan and to Lotta. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Jan, do you want to, or shall I, shall I answer? You can you can start if you want. I can jump, okay. jump in. Um, so limitations. Well, there's of course many. <laughs> um, so I think one of the limitations of the of the vape framework is that it's not very uh, interpretable right now so it's not very uh, and um, well it doesn't really tell you why a certain action gets a certain value so that might confuse uh, football minded people so to why why this value is uh, being given um, and as well I think we're, we're missing some of the context because we're using event data and not not tracking data mm. so for example in a in a counter attack um, well, the spaces may be very different than in a, like a slower attack. So that's something we try to capture with the, the with the, the framework, but we're we're certainly missing out some stuff. So I mm -hmm. think that's one of yeah you know, some of the limitations. Jan, do you have other? Uh... Uh, no, really, actually, those were also the two <laughs> I was thinking of. So uh, yeah, limited contextual information uh, indeed is probably the most important one. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, probably if we had or. If we could include tracking data um, in the framework, we can also better account for um, well tactical um, choices, for instance, by by a coach, which is currently quite hard to do. Mm. Yeah, it's also sometimes the feedback we get. Yeah, that so uh, some player is playing in a different tactical system, and maybe the coach tells him to to do certain st things. Um, and that's always hard, of course. Mm. Yeah. That sounds good. I know, um, Fran, I know that you've been sitting uh, implementing very similar models. We, we have something um, extremely that, um, that, that we use uh, both through the 12 system that we have, but we also yeah. have our own specialized mm -hmm. thing at Hammerby. Uh, maybe do you have a question? Uh, yeah, now that I do mention that, I may, may not, most of the things that you were talking now were passes and all of that, but I would like to know if you've done something with goalkeepers, how to evaluate the actions of the goalkeepers and how they can increase or decrease the probabilities of their own team scoring, apart from just, from just sending passes, like goalkeepers' actions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or I 
you can go. <laughs> okay. Um, so, well, we've been thinking about this. Um, so we do currently value, uh, value goalkeeper actions, but uh, we're not really satisfied with it yet. Um, mainly because um, it's, uh, well, we, we know what we now have is like, if you if a player has a shot, uh, has, there's an expected goals value for this shot. So there's like a probability that this, this shot will be a goal. And then you have a goalkeeper action, and then this this goalkeeper, if he stops the the ball, he gets actually like the expected goals value for this this stopping of the ball, kind of. Mm. Um, but the best way actually to do this, uh, how I feel it, is like to have like um, something like uh, a post expected goals model to to better value the the goalkeeper. So there's already um, so someone might shoot from from 20 meters, but he might shoot it like into the uh, the high uh, the bar. Mm. Or, or you might shoot it like in the middle to the keeper. That that should be different values for the goalkeeper. Um, mm -hmm. So it's something that, yeah. Jan? Yeah, I think this is also related to like a, well, uh, a limitation of the framework. So it operates on event data, which means we only observe what actually happens. Uh, well, or when, when someone is in possession of the ball and for defensive players, but also for goalkeepers, there's a lot of things going on that's not recorded in the event stream data. So there's actually pretty pretty poor signal in the in the event data to accurately uh, assess the performances of uh, of goalkeepers and and also for defenders I think so we've also been working on some solutions for that they're not part of the vape framework but they're built on top of it to uh, mm -hmm. to account for that fact so yeah 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 Javier do you have um I'm just putting you straight on the spotlight do you have a do you have a question yes um. Actually, I had several, so I'm I'm gonna try to. Them in <laughs> you're one. you're like more than one. Come on, try it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, you know, there's there's something. I mean, someone someone told me recently, uh, an interesting observation that was. Uh, he said, I think these models are too obsessed with goals, right? So he, what he was basically saying is that it wasn't valuing as much you know, uh, short-term value or actions that are far away from, from the goal. Mm -hmm. I tried to, uh, to explain a little bit that uh, the, uh, it depends also, I mean, since goals is the only objective thing you have, mm -hmm. uh, then you, you need to start from, that, from, from there in any way. So, but the question actually is, how could we uh, try to account more for short-term actions or short-term reward in, in mm -hmm. these models? Because if you take it as a um, reinforcement learning kind of approach, uh, mm -hmm. this will be basically, I mean, this and all the approaches we know on expected po position value and so on are uh, really focusing a lot on the long-term uh, long reward. And then the, w the way you define possessions changes a little bit how sparse or how, how far in time is that reward. Mm -hmm. But in the end, uh, no one has been able yet to actually accurately or objectively say, OK, this is how I can evaluate uh, uh, short term actions. Right. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that if you have that long pass uh, that mm -hmm. that that you show in the beginning, it will, of course, have a more a, a, a higher value because it's an immediate action that takes you so close to the goal. Uh, mm -hmm. But then it can unfairly attribute value to, you know, central backs that are having long play. So have, mm. you, have you thought about this or in, in ways in which we could uh, take that into account in, the, in a modeling perspective to then have like a more fine grain model for mm. that? Yeah, I think actually think this is a great point. And it's also, it's also something that our uh, framework actually supports, I would say. So, so currently we defined uh, success as a goal being scored within the next 10 actions, for instance, but you can actually design like a custom reward as well. So once you know a coach's tactics, for instance, if you know what uh, the coach uh, considers to be successful or, or not successful, you can actually encode this in the labels that we assign to the, to the, to the game states. And then you would actually learn uh, values based on the philosophy of the coach. So it would, would take a bit more effort, I guess, but it should be, it should be fairly uh, doable within the, the existing framework. And yeah, besides that, there's probably uh, a lot that we can still learn from like reinforcement learning with sparse rewards. That's, uh, I think, like an interesting direction to uh, to dig into as well. And with more yeah. data becoming available, that should be that should become feasible as well. I think. 
Can I, I just follow up on that? Because the, um, I mean, what it doesn't take into account, and I don't think it can, you see, I, I'm not quite sure I agree with you about that. I think that what it doesn't take into account is, for example, just sort of wearing out and stressing out the opposition by passing the ball backwards and forwards and sort of changing the flow of the game. And that you really can't get in with event data. Um, I'm not trying to, I'm, yeah, but, uh, what, I don't know if you've got a response. But what, what, how, how is that type of thing where you're actually trying to change the tempo and the feel of the game by playing the ball about possible to account for, or, or do you think well, it will be? Yeah, I would actually argue that you can, you can encode that in your, in your game states. Um, so the way we currently define game states is that we just look back to the previous three actions, essentially. But you can look back further if you want. And you can, you can uh, derive features from that. So if you notice that the, the, the ball hasn't progressed so, so much in the last half a minute, for instance, then you actually know that maybe they're trying to, to wear out the game. So we're, we're not like uh, considering all, all this information at this point, but we could, we could do it if we, if we wanted to, I think. Lotte, do you have something? Yeah, yeah I was just thinking, yeah. Um, yeah, I think so. I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's not perfect, but I think we can, uh, we can capture this, this thing in there. We have like a speed of, speed of play feature in there. So we measure like the speed of play of the, of the previous actions and you can like extend this. And then uh, well, if, if you train a really good model, it should be able to, to capture that, um, that such actions can be very valuable to like speed up the, the, the play. Uh, and that in the end uh, gives you like a long, long term reward. Um, but yeah, the, the signal is uh, sparse, of course, yeah. That, that beeping noise is Suds texting me to say that he wants to ask his question. <laughs> am, I, am I in though? I'll okay, get over to you, Sud. <laughs> no, just a, a question to follow up on all of this is um, if you wanted to evaluate the values of a certain subgroup, let's just say the two center backs and the number six, or let's say the left to back, uh, the left winger and the central midfielder, um, is the subgroups, is, a, is the vape of that subgroup just the summation of all the players or um, is there future work into looking into how effective certain subgroups are? Maybe not necessarily for recruitment, uh, could be just to see how certain players play within a certain two man, three man or two men, two women, three women um, mm -hmm. radius, but uh, also just for opposition analysis. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we did uh, some research in, on this. It's mainly focused on uh, player pairs. Um, so we looked into how how two players perform together uh, using these vape rate ratings, and in that way you can see like you can find players that uh, well uh, let them let each other play better or like worse. Um, it's on the, some work that we uh, presented at the MIT Sloan last uh, last year or this few months ago. Um, and there we also tried to, to predict uh, the chemistry, how we call it. So the vape ratings of two players when they uh, will play together. So if you want to, that's more like in a scouting uh, uh, thing. So if you want to, to assign a new player, to sign a new player, and then you want to know how he would play with all the well, 10 or well, all the 20 players that you already have at your squad, then you could use this framework to, uh, to predict that. Um, it's, it's pretty hard, but it's, uh, it, it, was, it was working for the offensive uh, part of it. Um, so yeah, that's something we looked into. I think for for more than two, it gets uh, it gets more difficult to see how like all subgroups work together. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a very complicated game, of course, football. Mm -hmm. But yeah. uh, well, we started with two. <laughs> yeah. and, and you uh, you won a you won the prize for the best at Sloan Sports Conference in what the Americans call other sports. Yeah, in other sports, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. In the other sports, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think like I'm just I, I forgot to I, I, I just want to have a look over at um, Virginia's um, uh, sketch here so I'm just going to put up that and see where we've got to a lot of lovely details of um, what we've been talking about this is especially for you Pascal who apparently says that it's much better to look at these than it is to listen to us talking so uh, he won't know that I said that unless you write it down there of course <laughs> Good. I'll, 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 I'll let you ask another question then, Xavier, because you, you had lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. Um, yeah, I was thinking about this. That I, th I mean, let's see. I mean, everyone trying to model this has uh, a very important 
limitation in, uh, in the modeling sense that is the definition of state. And our main issue is that we have to define state in any way. If we, if we, if we will have like a more flexible definition of state, that will be great. So, but that, that's, those are the kind of things we, we are always going to face. But there's something that is common um, to, uh, to football and I'm wondering how you guys uh, manage that in terms of scouting or in terms of players evaluation. And the, and the thing is that in basketball, um, possessions are limited by time. So even though you might have longer and, and shorter ones, in the end, you can basically, uh, well, uh, I'm not really a basketball expert, but mm -hmm. if, you, uh, if you average on possession, you're gonna gr uh, grasp lots of in interesting signals there that are not going to be obfuscated but by the length of the possession. But in football, you basically can start, you know, have a kickoff and keep the ball 45 minutes until the next one the opponent is, is going to have a kick up and you can steal the ball and then have it another 45 minutes. So it's interesting because um, you can keep passing the ball. And this is the actual question. Uh, position <laughs> like teams are going to pass the ball a lot. Uh, and then you're going to keep, I mean, if you add up BAP or BAP added, right? Or EPV added, you're going to mm -hmm. keep increasing that number and increasing that number. So Man City and Barcelona and PSG and so on teams uh, might have an unfair evaluation in value added because they have the possession longer times and they do more passes. So um, we did some approach in, in, in the last Sloan paper to try to account for that. But I'm just thinking how you guys, from your perspective, think that should be managed to properly account for the value of an action and not uh, provide, I'm saying that a player uh, uh, added many, a lot of value because he did 10 passes, 10, 10, uh, 10 short passes, uh, in contrast with another player that just did one pass that, that can be valuable, right? You see the mm -hmm. point? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can, I can answer to the, to the question. So it's, uh, well, of course, very interesting. I think the, the main uh, question for the, for the scout is always like, how will this player perform in our team? So if we would buy this player, how will, what will his, his value be for our team? And that's something we're looking into right now to see how, how a certain player will, uh, would behave in, the, in this tactical system. So maybe a player uh, at City is really good at the short passing, and, uh, but if he has to play at uh, Atletico Madrid and has to counter, maybe that's not really his, uh, well, his thing. Um, so that's something we're looking into right now um, uh, to like divide every action into some kind of uh, game principle, uh, that, that tactical game principle. Um, and um, oh yeah, also the thing about the number of actions. So uh, while well, we're currently also like uh, uh, redesigning the platform to, to give some more context on how a player got his rating. So is it like more because he uh, does a lot of actions or is it more because he uh, has like very high average value for his actions or does he have like a very high risk uh, risk a lot of risky actions but also had like really high reward like the type of players that that take a lot of risk uh, uh yeah you could have like the same average value if you have like a lot of, lot of risk but also lose the ball a lot um yeah. so that's something uh, we're also looking into to give more and more uh, insights to the to the well, to the scout in, in our case so i think it's also it's also really about um uh, presenting uh, the results actually in, in the right way that the football people can can use it and also can use it in the way that they, that it helps them to well, to find a new player for their team. But I, I, I'm just following up on that because I'm very with Javier that the massive limitation of this is exactly that the possession-based teams mm -hmm. get extra points uh, for it. And, and of course, you can try and say, oh, we identify the style of the teams, but that becomes very difficult because you can't learn, you can't machine learn the style of teams. And then another problem you see is that maybe what you think you're measuring isn't what you really are measuring. Uh, um, an example is that if you've got a very good player in, the, in your team, you give the ball to that player more often. And so that's a very simple way that, okay, you measure that they got a lot of value, but the reason they're adding a lot of value is because they're allowed to add a lot of value. They're, everyone says, get the ball to that player and let them add value. And of course, yeah, you're, you're identifying a valuable player, but maybe not for because they're they're particularly good at giving those actions just because everyone around them thinks that they're good which a scout can see anyway do you, do you see what i'm getting at there 
Again, I'm asking mm -hmm. questions. I have no yeah. idea what the answer is or how you how you solve yeah, it. Yeah, so I, I agree that if you have like the chance to do it, uh, well, if you get the ball more often, you can you can get more value. But in the other, in the other way, you still need to increase the game set value to get positive uh, reward, to mm. get the positive uh, action rating. So um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you get higher ratings. But we do see like more possession based. Well, I like the, the higher teams get higher ratings. Mm. Well, quite often. Um, but it's like very interesting to look into two players. Uh, well, from a scout perspective, that play at like a lower uh, team and are like really outstanding in their team. Which yeah, are like the interesting mm. ones. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably also good to mention that um, the values can also be negative. So a player doesn't yeah. necessarily get positive value for, for performing actions. And what we've noticed is that our framework is actually pretty good at also picking up the negative rewards um, that someone's responsible for. Yeah. This is one of my one of my pet things. Would you accept that humans are better than than your method at evaluating players? <laughs> cool. Well, I would say yes. I don't just mean a random person, drunk person watching TV. I mean a professional scout. Mm -hmm. Like so, because you know we deal with our our scout, and mm -hmm. I think he's better than our system. <laughs> at, uh, I don't know. He seems to be anyway. He gives that air of comp competence. <laughs> uh, what, what, what do you think? Well, I guess here, um, I would say yes, of course, the human will be better uh, because our framework is only evaluating certain aspects of someone's uh, um, well, performances and there's like way more uh, angles mm. to it. So if the question would be, um, well, are all your metrics combined uh, better than a human scout or not, then I would probably say yes. But if you're just talking about FAPE ratings or what we call contribution ratings at size sports, then well, probably the answer is no, because there's uh, a lot of factors that the framework doesn't account for, but which we do account for using other metrics that we've developed. But, but who's, yeah, okay. Right, well, I'll, I'll <laughs> let you have that answer. I'll, let, I'll go on to another question. Do you, Fran or Suds, do you have something before we go on to talking about how? Uh, no, well, just one small thing, like on this thing about like uh, players that have many actions because they might receive the ball a lot. Uh, I don't know if you just consider the simple thing of not just adding the value, but having the value per action done. Like mm -hmm. super simple approach, but maybe it doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. yeah, we also look into that. Yeah, yeah. So, so you can also see like the, the value per action. Uh, yeah. And then also like uh, to see like the more like the, the positive ones that you have and also the negative ones. Mm -hmm. So average value can be similar for, um, uh, why am I only have Dutch play? For like mm -hmm. Wijnaldum, like a very a player that doesn't take any risk, and uh, and uh, more like Sierre, a player that does take a lot of risk. They have like they have like similar values, but one gets them because of like a lot of high value actions and also a lot of very negative value actions, and, mm. and the other just by never losing the ball. So yeah. Yeah. Maybe the the thing with with football is that if you value um you know basically average value, which is value per action. Uh, then you're going to favor uh, direct playing teams and very vertical teams because you have short and a few passes and there are very intense ones. And if they actually make them, uh, it's, it's, it's what football has. I mean, that, that counterbalance, it's, it's complicated. Probably the thing is that, uh, I mean, at least from our perspective uh, in terms of, of how to use this in practice that David mentioned that a little bit in the beginning is that... Um, Maybe, I mean, I think it's very complicated to actually get just one single value and say, this is, you know, how you evaluate players. And I know you guys know that well, but what this model uh, or these kind of models can be uh, very useful for is to really get in like uh, into more fine grain analysis of the game and understanding why certain group of actions are in improving or decreasing the value or the, the main idea of risk versus reward or understanding how a team values that in the different types of context the game can have. So um, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be only like a value for, you know, evaluating possessions in, in general or players in one match or players in the whole season that can be useful for that. But you can also account for, uh, you know, more specific parts of the game in which you can probably add some information to the coach because if we go to the general perspective more or less going into the in the david's question of scout versus machine mm -hmm. uh, in the generality or in the big picture uh, i think human being has a very big advantage uh, but if you get into that fine-grained things you might help uh, through the use of data mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I guess this is like an important uh, nuance uh, that needs to be made. So most of the metrics that we develop at SciSports are not tailored to match analysis, but really to recruitment. So most of the time we're looking at like larger um, sets of actions that players have performed. And our primary goal is to just flag players who, who stand out in a particular league. And well, obviously there are some limitations to the method, but despite these limitations, it's does, well, it still does like a really good job at identifying players who stand out in, in performing certain types of, of, of actions. And that's, uh, well, well, that that actually allows um, well scouts to uh, to devote their time their time to something else like watching video footage or wa like um, watching uh, players uh, play uh, in uh, in uh, real life, for instance. And, uh, another question I have is um, I don't know if you guys work on this, but if you create kind of like a density map, the place and also the value of that uh, action. Um, is this a useful tool that you guys see for being able to identify if a player is particularly good against a certain type of formation? Uh, we know that formation is very dynamic and it's very fluid and it's changing all the time. But uh, is it one way of being able to identify that this particular player is able to create high value actions in these certain areas of the field against a certain system? And how do you then separate different approaches, tactics, if they are employing uh, a similar system like 433 or 4. Mm -hmm. Should I answer, Ayan? Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, missed, I think answer. Par partially missed, uh, missed yeah, the, the last question. part I also missed. But... Um, but I guess here, like, probably my answer to this question would be that, um, well, we, we arrive at like a, a value for each individual action, and afterwards we can still do all uh, kinds of slicings of, the, of, of our actions. So um, if you're like particular, if you're interested in analyzing a particular aspect, for instance, performing well against a, uh, a particular um, tactical system, you can just well take out well those actions that were performed against that type of uh, tactical system and see how well the player performed there. So that's also some uh, something uh, Lotte briefly touched upon in the, in her presentation. So there's like a, well uh, many different ways in which you can actually use these action ratings, and for us. Most of the time, they're just like um, more like a theoretical building block, and then we're trying to build other applications on top of that, like the, the player chemistry work that uh, Lot already mentioned. We've done some other um, well uh, types of ratings as well. We've, we've we've analyzed different slices of the data. Um, yeah, so that would probably not be my answer to your question. So we haven't done this like specific analysis, but uh, the framework um, well allows you to do so if you're if you're interested in that type of questions. Oh, really great questions. What we're going to do now is go over to just saying a little bit about how each of us use um, this type of approach in, in our own work. Um, and I thought I'd, I'd start by picking on uh, Javier because I know <laughs> boss uh, Raul is very skeptical to a lot of things to do with event data. And I think he told me this on the record when I did this interview with him for the Barcelona Innovation Hub. He had a lot of sort of skepticism about use of event data because you couldn't really pick out the context and so on. So is this is this something that you find useful in, in, in your work or are you just dedicated purely to tracking data to answer these types of questions? Well, I think that uh, this, uh, these three cards that uh, Lotte shown and, and explained a little bit, you know, the different advantages and limitations of event data and tracking data are 100% accurate. And uh, I shared that, um, that idea in terms that, uh, of course, I mean, if you, if you get to uh, analyze a game model, and in, in, in the case of Barcelona, the, the game model is very specific, and then uh, it's very centered in everything happening around the, the ball and the 22 players and space-time dynamics. Uh, it comes up to mind immediately that you will need uh, tracking data to try to account for those things. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the information to actually start talking with coaches about the things they're thinking about if you're uh, looking at that. But definitely limitations, I mean, or, or, or a big issue of tracking data is availability. Um, I, they actually wrote something that, that is exactly how it is that you might have it for one team or one league, but it's not really uh, often we had uh, for like a big, uh, like for many leagues. So uh, basically, if you build an expected goals model with basic event data, but with a lot 
of data, you will have that, that model calibrated immediately. If, if you try to do it with tracking data, you will need way more tracking data to get that. Um, if you're taking into account, for example, shops. So you always need that merge. And in terms of looking at different, I mean, different teams and di different leagues, I think it's very important to take, a, I mean, to really take or to squeeze uh, event data as much as possible. Um, what I do think is, I mean, we did start very, uh, you know, very well, very main focused on tracking data. And then we start realizing that with event data, we can uh, also extract a lot of value. Um, I think uh, Devin Ploller has, has said this very, uh, like many times, and it's, it's interesting that uh, if we could take information or learn from tracking data, contextual information to build models that can spot that for an event data, right? And I think that is possible. For example, if you, if you take passes that break lines and you're taking a look at breaking the first line, you might say like, yes, I cannot evaluate where a pass breaks first line or or not, if I don't have tracking data. But if you learn from tracking data that there's certain characteristics of passes breaking lines, you might, you know, have some signal and say, okay, I'm more or less sure that these passes are breaking the first line. You're not gonna have them all, but if you start adding that kind of information, probably you will have more validated information to evaluate players and evaluate teams. So that merge is interesting. And I think in in few words that people working or making lots of emphasis on event data and people making lots of emphasis of tracking data probably are making emphasis on the type of data they have. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> you can progress a lot in both things because basically soccer analytics is just uh, in the beginning, there's a lot of questions to answer. An example for that is uh, the mental pressure model of Lotte and, and Jan. And, I'm missing the other authors. If, if there's anyone else, sorry for that. Um, it's a very good example of very different types of questions which you will need, or it's not necessary to have tracking data to answer good things or new things in football. So I think uh, <coughs> lots of work can be done on both lines. Mm -hmm. and also, yeah, I, re I really like this point as well. Uh, so I think there's definitely a lot of we can, uh, we can learn from tracking data to also enrich the uh, event uh, database models. At the same time, I also think there's a lot we can learn from video. So for each match for which we have the event stream data, there's also a corresponding video because pretty much all the companies use the video uh, to collect the uh, to collect the event data. Uh, so with uh, with nowadays computer vision algorithms, we can probably uh, fairly easily enrich the event stream data with some uh, additional contextual information that comes from the video uh, data rather than from the tracking data, which we uh, might not always have at our disposal. So I think like. Trying to combine information from different sources like event data, tracking data, and video data is like an interesting uh, direction to uh, to move forward. Critical. I mean, if you if you want to pick a data source, pick video, right? Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about event data and, uh, and tracking data because we want to do analysis with, with the data, but the video is also a way of having data. I mm -hmm. always say that. I mean, I've faced so many times on. Um, an, an error on an algorithm or in a modeling uh, mm -hmm. approach. Um, I spotted that in video so, so many times that I wonder how can you actually do that without the video? I mean, <clears throat> you can do it, but the video can really show you things like, oh shit, I'm, I'm, I'm missing this or I'm missing that or actually this value is going up because mm -hmm. of this reason. I don't know if we have mentioned this in this channel, but uh, and I'm, I'm gonna say it all wrong. But the, there was this paper on a convolutional neural network trying to identify, I think, some kind of wolves, right? The mm -hmm. short story is that they basically, oh, yeah. I, I think it was comparing... Um, Backgrounds. Uh, yeah, you know, um, mm -hmm. winter kind of wolves. And so, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's actually yeah. spotting the background, right? So that's a really good example. And many people will, will say, yeah, that's why you just cannot use black box models. Uh, what I'm saying is, is Maybe it doesn't have to be that much with the implementation you use, but the validation is being uh, followed for that. So video is, is a good way of validating that uh, in some way. Yeah, and the video is also a great communication um, well, channel to the to the end user, to the or to the scout, to the football coach. So people are already used to looking to looking video. So if you incorporate the video in your models, it might also be easier to explain what your uh, what your model does uh, using using video as well. I think. Actually, just, just seeing how far apart are players in the video 
and how close they 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 seem when you plot two D data. I mean, just the just just the problem of how big those circles must be when you're plotting a two D data. It's important because almost all the time players are going to seem closer mm -hmm. from your perspective, but in actual video you have five meters and ten meters or eight meters, and and if you're just looking at the data, you might say, okay. Um, there's, there's something wrong, but when you just look at one image on the video or just like a picture, you will say, okay, no, a uh, player can definitely put a pass there. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's very mm -hmm. illuminating. <laughs> um, can I, I ask you, Suds, because I've heard you talked about lots of things, but I never have you talked exactly this type of value. You're the, the value added models that I've seen you talk about are more the ones that are based on the tracking data. Is, is this a technique that you um, use at Benfica? Um, event data is actually fairly new to us, uh, seeing that we've only started receiving it um, in recent seasons. Uh, so the main benefit that we use it for is the fact that tracking data still takes more than 12 hours to process. Um, so after a game is over, uh, tracking data takes 12 to 16 hours for us to get the results of that back. Mm -hmm. And if we want to try to produce something quickly, uh, event data is the way to go, but it's still relatively new within here. Mm. Um, so you're not, you're not really using it in any extensive, extensive way just now. Uh, not yet. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Fran, you've been, um, I know that, I know that you've been working a lot on this type of thing because we've been making these, player radars so maybe you could just say a little bit about um how yeah how, how think, we've been using well like, actually the most interesting time. thing that we've mainly using it for is for showing giving feedback to players about what they do during matches like after they play a match we of course like using these kind of models we evaluate every actions of the players and we can directly link the, their best and worst actions with real videos of the matches and uh, send them to and send that to, to the players so that they can watch them on their phones. So like uh, whenever they make a wrong pass, they get negative points, of course. So whenever they make a foul, they do that. So they got like the 10 best actions and four or five worst actions that they did. And, and they can see it directly in their phones using this kind of uh, models. Mm -hmm. And then like a different thing is of course the scouting part where you can just show these spider plots, but not only the basic ones with just number of shots and number of saves for goalkeepers, but actually the points per action or points per 90 minutes that those actions give to those players, which is like more like an insightful thing, not just, not just the numbers. But yeah, I think for us, the most interesting thing is definitely like uh, the communication with the players using combining these models with the real video, as you were saying before. I think one, one benefit that's not necessarily around um, value of the action is that event data has been very helpful for us to create very baseline uh, models around uh, cutting the game into different phases. Uh, of course, using tracking data, you will be able to be a bit more contextual um, and with video even much more so. But uh, because of the fact that we get event data very quickly um, and if you built a model around trying to cut the game into different phases, it's a very quick way to be able to at least provide some sort of context um, in a very quick and in a very quick manner. Mm -hmm. So less about the value action, but more about just trying to add some simple contextual pieces of the game after the game is finished. Yeah, I think I, for me, I mean, I, I was thinking about this while Fran was Fran was speaking. Is that at Hammerby we use this in every aspect of of what happens. Uh, mm -hmm. So we use it in scouting. There's a couple of players that we've pretty much bought on the basis of these type of, I mean, well, yeah, we, after the chief scout has uh, definitely said that these are the players, but this, the, we've, the statistics are definitely used in that way. Then they're, they're used in KPIs for looking at the players over to be a little bit careful there because there are a lot of things you're, you're not picking up there. Um, and also one of my favorite stories is coming back to what Fran said about using it with the players is we had one player who everybody thought that he was rubbish defensively and he even thought he was rubbish defensively. This is Darian Bojanic. I've told this story quite a few times now, but I don't think I've told it here. And um, we could look at the stats and he was getting the ball back in important places. And then he was delivering the ball very quickly up the field. In fact, he was one of our best defending players. 
So it's it's really nice to be able to use that thing in a sort of positive, constructive, constructive way within within teams. Um, I think maybe I'm wondering on that point. Is is anyone else got um, something they'd like to add add at this point, or Javier probably? <laughs> <laughs> and now you're very quiet. <laughs> um, I'm uh, very satisfied with this. I think we're going to be, we're going to, for me, I, I've outlined this a few times in the other Friends of Tracking's videos. For me, I, I see our, the ambition of, of this whole project is we're trying to, first, we've been looking at a lot of what Laurie's been doing about the pitch control, um, looking at how the probability of completing passes and, and, and so on. And now we're going to really go over to the value aspect of the thing because I mean, the pitch control is really nice as of showing what's possible, but it doesn't actually show how much it adds to things. And uh, that is going to be very exciting to hear your guys' videos um, coming up after the expected goals because I think that will be the key for many of the people who are working on different projects that they'll be able to now assess the value as well of different actions. Mm -hmm. So um, you'll be, I've, I've got one more video in the expected goals series. Next week, I've organized that Gary Gallade, who has done a lot of work on scouting, is going to come in and um, talk about his work on evaluating on models for, for scouting. Um, but during the week, you'll have one more from me and you'll have five more uh, from, from these guys. <laughs> so um, thanks a lot to Lotte and Jan for coming in and we'll see you next week. See you later. Bye.